Good morning. First of all, good morning. Good morning, good morning meetings. Yay. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. It's 8.30 on Tuesday, February 14th, 2023. And this is the meeting of the Camp Point Arts, Culture, and Preservation Committee. And we're now calling it to order. Um, for the record, I am Chairwoman Ellen Sessas, presiding at City of San Point Council Chambers at 111. 1123 Lake Street in San Juan, Idaho. Uh, commission members proper, Kenneth Combs. Barry Burns. Huey Gray. Caitlin Chick. Karen Diedemeyer. Woody Sherwood. And Mike is on Zoom. Oh, and yes, I, I can hear you. Hi there, Mike. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Yep. And Rick Tucker just pulled in. All right, uh, number three, uh, meeting minutes approval. We will now proceed with the approval of the minutes from the commission's last meeting. Uh, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes from January 24th, 2023 meeting. I have one note. Um, I think Caitlin's name was spelled in two different ways. Oh. Can you the correct <laughs> spelling, please? Mm -hmm. Oh, and uh, also, my last name was uh, on number seven, Gray, G R A Y. Thank you for catching. So, geez, I was going to mention it, but then Hannah did, so I was like, okay. <laughs> I can mention this thing. Please do. <laughs> All right, I'd like to entertain a motion to uh, approve the minutes with those changes. Second. Second. Uh, All in favor? Any opposed? I abstain. I wouldn't hear it though, it, so I can't. And Mike, you can hear it. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> All right, then that motion passes. Minutes are approved. <laughs> All right. Recording or progress. Sorry. Are you okay? Onward to the financial report, core A. Uh, the downtown budget is $144,094.16. The northern region budget is $78,928.04. Uh, the remaining balance in the silver box budget is $5,159.78. Is there any questions on that? I do want to make a comment. This is a, a monthly report with the financial report for SURA. Uh, Anna, you asked about that in the last meeting. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> All right, onward to old business. Uh, looks like we have a report on the cultural collective campaign. Yes, I just wanted to give you all an update about that. Um, so we are on our way and um, it's really exciting to see this project already um, positively influencing the city and the projects that are happening. I met with Ross Hall, who is the son of the famous photographer Ross Hall uh, yesterday. And um, he's a big part of the Bay Trail. And that was what the conversation was particularly about. And I used that opportunity to talk with him about um, having an oral history um, through the cultural collective campaign and he's really excited about sharing his story his family's story and archival documents um, through that um, vehicle and um, so that's going to be happening soon and i can't wait to see how it all comes together i'm very excited and then i'm also um, scheduling an appointment with carol diener who's with poac and she's kind of like the mother of public art here. <laughs> There's a few of them. And um, I'm going to get the history of public art from her and a little bit about you know, her impact here in the community and so forth. So um, it's, it's just happening and I'm really excited about it. Very good. Uh, is there any questions on the collective campaign? 
if any of you would like to join me during any of those, just shoot me an email and let me know because I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I'd love to. Ask. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Keep it updated. Sounds great. All right, moving onward then to new business, uh, 6A. We are going to talk about our project teams. Perfect. Okay. Thank you all so much for responding back to me. Um, we have the three projects going on, and um, I just wanted to kind of dive in a little further on each one of them. Um, so, and I sent you all that are on the particular team um, a the supporting documents that you need um, for the project. So the first one is the City of Sandpoint's public art policy. Um, and Ellie, I'm gonna have you support me a little bit on this and anyone else who was on the Arts Commission when you developed this. So my understanding was that you created a really solid foundation for a public art policy back in 2016, and it got pretty far. And then um, all of a sudden, um, there, there was kind of a change with the commission, and so it got put on pause. Um, so I thought what would make the most sense is to go ahead and start with this as our foundation. And then what we wanna do is take this document, it's five pages, so it has the purpose and goals. I felt like it was very well thought out. Um, and then it talks about it, the commission itself. Um, updates that I organically see with this document would be to make sure that the uh, chapter 10 code is applied to this. So it reflects the new Arts, Culture and Historic Preservation Commission. Um, we would also want to compare it to other cities that are similar to ours. Um, you know, times have changed a little bit. Um, so, what I think we need to do and um, with the teams, and I'm open to discussion about this is particularly for this one, I think it's important to have a, a separate um, meeting here with the team. So we can kind of do a deep dive, dissect it. Um, and then that team will come back to the commission and make recommendations on changing changes that need to be made. It will share that and then the formal vote can be made on that. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, in addition to this document, we, um, so for anything with um, building and development, they have civic space and one of the options with civic space, and I'll do a deeper dive um, down the road with that, but would be public art. So there, I think it would behoove us to look at what that process looks like. So for instance, if there's a development that did choose public art, it will come to us as the commission to be approved. So that definitely should be in here on okay. how that process looks with me being the city liaison. Um, so that would be also an addition that needs to be made to this document. Does that apply to murals as well or just other types? That's a great question. Um, yes, so murals and public art. And I think we should kind of keep those a little separate um, because murals can be on private property. Any mural within the city limits has to be come through us. And we actually have two murals um, that, that are going to be coming to us. One of them with Janice with the Lions Club, she already came and presented. And then I did get a call from the senior center and they're playing around with the idea of having a mural on their building as well. So yeah, it's really exciting and it's happening. And the great thing is, is that we do have a mural policies and procedures already developed. It's on the website. So I was able to direct them to that as a starting place. Um, so I think something similar to that mural policy would be a really great thing. We want to create a roadmap for the public that's really easy for them to use and understand about this is how this works. So, th so that's the goal that we want to gain. Um, so it would be mural, public art, those are the procedures, and then we have our policy too. Um, does anybody have any questions about this particular project? Perfect. So you're going to be hearing from me, all that signed up to be on this team. 
And uh, we're just going to dive right into it. I'm really excited about it. Very good. Who was here when we did it six years ago? I can't believe it's been six years ago. Were you here? I think very much. Um, yeah, we did a deep, deep dive with the entire commission. We spent a lot of time on it. And it was actually nice to have everyone involved. However, I can see the value of doing the small teams first, doing the research, um, you know, doing the comparing to other cities, um, you know, in the, our state and in other states uh, as the team first. And then I would like to see it brought back and have a good discussion with the entire commission. You know, once we're pretty, uh, you know, have a lot of research under our belt and can really put forth good sure. information. I'm so thankful for all of you for participating. Um, it's hugely helpful. I, I just wanted to make one comment that we want to make sure as far as documents we're cross-referencing off too, that we get this absolutely. one included. Oh, absolutely. yes, definitely. Thank you. In Woody. fact, that's you know part of the reason that we we put off finishing what we had started is because we knew that the master plan was coming and we knew that there would be changes. And of course, in six years, there, there's been quite a few changes so uh you know that we have to incorporate so we're absolutely going to do that perfect can you share who's working on each of the work yes absolutely um i left my little piece of paper so i'm gonna follow this up here um so let's see here well ellie bless her heart is working on every single project <laughs> And um, sorry, just one second here. Well, White and then Karen, you're also going to be working on the policy. And Caitlin, I'm just going to do this from my memory. So here we go. So that's for um, the policy. And, and, and I do understand bandwidth. So if you guys don't have time to participate, I totally understand. Um, if you decide that you can't wait to participate and you haven't signed up yet, there's still availability. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if anyone has uh, questions or comments uh, for any of the groups that are outside of that particular group, you can uh, address them to me and I can type them to the group. Does that work? Absolutely. Do we have uh, access to the policy document? Yes, yes, I can send that out to everybody. Would that make sense? Okay, beforehand, okay. I'm definitely gonna arm you guys with all the information you need. So the second project, if, if you guys are okay moving forward, would be the um, public art inventory. And so Ellie, you were a spearhead on this. I know Carol was as well. Um, and it's a fantastic document. It's a an Excel um, doc here. Let me see if I can minimize. I have all my controls and everything on my screen here covering it up. But essentially, it has all the different categories of, um, there we go, art here. So we have the artist, location, medium, status, cost, funding source, and then a little thumbnail here. Um, so I really great working document definitely i think enough time has gone by where we need to update it um so i took that document and i created a template that i felt would be a great sorry guys here we go um i just kind of condensed a little bit understanding like what categories were really used and what weren't so we have the thumbnail photo where it's located, the artist, the medium, cost and funding source. Costs, if we have it, not necessarily the most important. The funding source, definitely important. Was this donated? Was this a Sura project? The install date and then DS session would be if it was damaged and it needed to be removed. Um, and then down below, I created these tabs and I think I overdid it a little bit. Um, <laughs> But what I did was I went on the website and I took every single public space that's listed because you never know where that one piece might be. Um, the community garden um, would definitely be the healing garden. I use the same um, 
vernacular off of the website for consistency. So um, I thought it'd be fun to kind of break it up in that way. Um, so we have kind of a joint cross-reference there. Um, so it, it's about taking the information we previously have, inputting it into this document. But the other aspect of this project, this is going to be so much fun. It's kind of like a Where's Waldo of public art, mm -hmm. where you're going to have your camera or your phone, and you're going to go out and take a really good photo. So it's not just for an inventory purpose. Um, I think, you know, let's look at where the sunlight is. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> yeah, because phones these days have such high resolution, right? But we want these photos to be a tool that we can use on our website, that we can use in PowerPoint presentations and, you know, and so on. So it'd be fun to just have a, a picture of the art piece, but then maybe we can have a picture of the kids playing on it, you know, at one point. So I, I see this as an opportunity to really capture our public art in motion. Um, and, and when I say children, we just want to get the backs of their heads. You know, we can't see their faces. That's a, a little FYI for the city. Um, so I think this is going to be a real fun one. And this time of year is a little sad. Um, so I see this project as an ongoing one. And as soon as we get rid of the dirty snow, <laughs> I think there's an opportunity. <laughs> but, I, but also, why not capture this community in the winter times too? There's also another project that I created um, independently at the city, which is a master archive photo file. And so I'm taking all these photos that, that we're compiling and I'm putting them in on our city's S drive and every division can have access to those photos. So whenever we're doing a city master plan or presentation, the city staff can use that. There's permissions already attached to them. Like it's just a really good resource for them. So um, your work will be um, definitely shared with the community in that regard through all of the planning that's going on here. Um, so does anybody have any questions about this project particularly? Is there like a time, a date when you see that? No, this is ongoing. But I think it would be really helpful to get this going up and running because we have the Sandpoint Design Competition that will be happening. And again, we want to ha really have an understanding of the historic preservation, which we'll get into, and public art as we're moving forward. So we can be able to, to share that with, with all of the designers that are participating. Um, so, you know, that's just something to keep in mind to get a rough idea of maybe what we have. And then I think the picture thing is an ongoing one, though. Actually, I have a lot of pictures that I can share with you. Oh, fabulous. On the drive. You know, we'll probably get more, but um, the other thing I was going to say is uh, talking with Carol Beaner actually will be a big part of filling in a lot of the gaps. I mean, you've got access to some of the yes. information if you have, you know, if you search. Mm -hmm. There's some things that are obviously, you know, lost in the ether of yes. the city for the older projects, but uh, Carol Beaner will be a good. Um, she and I have been meaning to get together to fill in some of those Perfect. gaps. So that's that. And then also when we get the team together uh, to go look at things, and if you're going to take pictures, take your cleaning products with you. Because last time we went, um, you know, <laughs> I took the the uh, the sweeper from for the ceiling to oh. get the cobwebs off of the, <laughs> some of the artwork. You know, yes. they don't get maintained as much as mm -hmm. we would probably like. So mm -hmm. once in a while I go out. <laughs> and that would be a good thing. I'm glad you're bringing that up. Maybe not on this document, but on additional document, if you see something that really should be addressed with that public art piece, just make a note of it. Like, wow, you know, this really needs to scrub down or be repainted. Yeah, and, and I think then I have a category on my sheet and probably should have a yeah. maintenance sheet because that's-, that's I like the, the separate maintenance sheet. I yeah, think that's a really good idea. Good. Because we do have to take care of, we, that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we really need to do is have a maintenance program for the pieces that we have and the pieces that we have going forward so that we maintain them in a way that is respectful and to keep them in a condition that will prolong their life. Indeed, absolutely. Um, so this team is comprised of Caitlin, Barry, and Ellie. Awesome. Any questions about this project? 
perfect. And again, it's, it's a big body of work. It's an ongoing thing. Um, but I, I think it's a great opportunity to kind of do a refresh on that. Um, so the last thing, and I don't have a document to present to you, would be that really great um, supporting calendar. So that's um, funding opportunities, education opportunities, really cool events that are happening. Um, and that team is comprised of Ellie, Hannah, and Keely. And I'm kind of letting you girls like take your fabulous admin skills and just do your <laughs> magic. What I would like to see though, would be maybe some type of link where it could have a quick description of like what that grant is. Oh yeah, just at a glance. Right, yeah. so that would be my only comment to that. Um, and in fact, I sent you all the document that Carol put together. Um, sorry, I gotta just pull it up here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I liked how she did it. So you certainly have, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. here we go. And, it, and I think it should be maybe in that calendar format, but there's actually a link to a website here. And then she just has a small little sentence or two about what that is. So I, I think you guys are gonna put together great concept. Um, do you guys feel like this is something there should be like a, a team meeting for or to break out or maybe this is something you all break out in a section? Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So I'll send out, you know, that initial cue and then we'll create that team moment and then create the structure and go from there. I love it. Okay. So the only question I have is, well, last question. can you just give us a little uh, overview of what this team meeting looks like so that we are all above board and uh, know the rules? Absolutely. So Ellie is talking about how we do this according to open meeting law. So again, um, all the communication comes to me and then I filter it back to you guys. So that's one thing we always want to keep in mind. So I'm your central point of communication. And then um, I'll, and I'm, I'm working closely with Ellie as our chair. She's supporting me with helping organize the groups so far. Um, and all of our teams are about two to three people. So we're, we're under that forum um, so scenario, which is great. Um, so I see us meeting, um, here at the city, uh, we have you know great access to technology, which will be useful. Or we could you know meet at a coffee house or wherever we're most comfortable, Tango Cafe, um, and just kind of essentially, it doesn't have to be recorded or anything, and work on the project. And then what we're doing is gathering information, getting organized, and then the recommending to the group. That's the key thing. And then the group makes that final decision. And then with all of these projects um, that are appropriate to run through council, which would be like the policies and procedures, the other items are more of um, tools for us to use. Um, but the final recommendation for the policies and procedures would be going to council. Any questions about those processes or anything like that? Perfect. Very good. All right, if there's no further questions on the groups, then we're at item number 16, which is our city junior series. Okay. So this is, um, I have to like come up with a title for everything. And uh, the city leader series is something that came to me. Um, actually, Rick, you had mentioned the snow issue and I had I should have in that meeting said, well, that's Amanda. Have you met Amanda? She was great, like right in that meeting. And it occurred to me that it would be a wonderful thing to have all of you meet the leaders of the city um, and see where the synergy is with that group, with our group and how you plug into the projects that they're working on. And so um, I will be, uh, when appropriate, um, when, it, when it's context based with a project that we're working on, I'll have a leader come and present. And I'm really excited to have today Maeve Nevin-Leftar here to um, present and 
And Maeve and I work closely we, uh, with Amy Tweetner, the placemaking team. And you're so incredible to be here today because you are not contagious, but you have been through a lot with strep and a myriad of things. And so I really appreciate you coming here today to share um, your position, what you do, a bit of your background, and then how, how we can help support you. Great, well, thank you. Um, I'm wearing my mask because I don't want you to get sick in case I still have anything, but it's been two, it's almost 20 days, so. <laughs> I just want to be careful, um, but I'm smiling. So I'm having a huge smile over here. And thank you for having me. I, I'm excited. Um, we, the three of us actually work really closely, um, Heather and Cami and I, we, we are the placemaking team. We are the creative corner, if you will, of the city. Um, and there's been a lot of change in the last couple of years, as you all know. Cami's been here for a very long time and has seen, years seen a change. So, um, you know, where I've been here for about a year and a half. Um, and then we brought Heather on and it, you can just see the rainbow of color coming through. And it's um, really attributed to Heather and the work that you're all doing in the community and bringing, bringing that color in. And, um, it's not just about color, it's about culture, it's about history, it's about connection to place, and just there's so much depth in what you all bring to our community. So it's an honor for me to be here. My One of my favorite people, two of my favorite people are right here that I work with. And um, truly, I don't think that I'd, I'd still be here because it's a little crazy sometimes, standpoint, <laughs> if it wasn't for these ladies. So um, I, I just, I'm just so humbled. So thank you. Um, so I'm going to put on my Zoom and share my screen. I think the, the, when I was thinking about what would be a benefit to you all, um, what came to mind was to share a little bit about my personal story. And um, Heather, how long do I have? You know, let's see here. What time is it? Um, about nine. Okay. I think, it, I know, Hannah, you have to skip out. So everybody's pretty good, like 30 minutes. Yeah. All right. So I, I was thinking to give you a little bit more story about who I am, what what brought me to this point in my career, and then a little bit about my background and all of my projects. Um, and then from there, we will dive into where you fit into work that I do. So uh, bear with me here. I'm going to bounce through some things. Um, so my background, I actually was um, born and raised in Vermont, and um, my birthday was a week ago, so I'm in my mid-40s. I just turned 47, which is hard to imagine, actually, and um, I'm deeply rooted in the landscape. My background educationally is landscape architecture, but growing up in Vermont, I was raised by um, two hippie artists, and my parents are writers. My dad was a music critic and a social worker, so I had this very strong pull to humanitarian side and to helping out your neighbors. I think Vermont's very similar to Sandpoint. It's this, almost the same latitude. Um, the mountains aren't as big as Alaska, where I most recently came from, but there are mountains and hills everywhere, and the neighbors look out for each other, and it's just a very um, down-to-earth, connected-to-nature type of a place, very, very similar with all the same things, you know, the mountains and the, and the lakes and the rivers. Um, and my, my, my childhood was not easy. Um, my father's very abusive and I ultimately was raised by my mom for most of my childhood. And um, the way that I got out of that type of a, a lifestyle um, and not get sucked into all the negative things was I was a super athlete and I didn't really honor my um, my brain or my creative side very well, but I got myself a full scholarship to a boarding school to ski race. And that was pretty cool because it opened up the doors of um, culture and travel and people from all over the world and um, the diversity that you could have where here I was growing up in North America, far, far north, almost in Canada. And everyone was white, very similar to here. There wasn't any diversity unless I went to Boston. Um, and to be able to go to that boarding school where I was exposed to so many people from around the world um, was really a, a foundational moment in my life. Um, and 
I guess part of, you know, when you're young and you're, you're a little rebellious or you're coming you're through trauma as a child of, of abuse, um, you know, at least for me, I was always seeking these outlets to propel myself so I didn't feel anymore. And I think that was the scariest thing. It saved me and I was um, hugely successful in that, and relatively speaking, in that I had um, a career that then went on and got me to college, but I immediately went to college in, in Crested Butte, Colorado. And if any of you have heard of Crested Butte, Colorado, it's one of those ski meccas of the world. And it's, at the time, this was in the, in the early 90s, and there were maybe one woman to every, I don't know, eight or nine guys. And here I was, a young, strapping woman, and the guys just took me skiing all the time instead of going to school. So I... <laughs> I didn't go to school very much. I went skiing. And it started in August of my first year. And I, I went back country and um, fell in love with these monster mountains, fell in love with finding ways to get on top of them. And then um, proceeded to study intro to art. And I went to class, you know, two hours a week, maybe, and didn't show up. And I studied intro to recreation, didn't show up to class, and continued this trend until finally I had to drop out. I realized that. Um, I wasn't going to ski race anymore. I announced to my mom that, you know, all that money we had spent, all that training, I was going to go be a, a free skier, whatever that meant. I wanted to do the extremes. I wanted to go to Alaska. The, the end goal was to go to Alaska and be heli skiing, ultimately ski guiding. Um, but in that course, it took me 11 years to finally go to college and finish it. I did go in and out of school, but in those years, I um, worked construction and excavation. And I was a dirt worker. I was a laborer. I was a pipe crew. Um, I'm very comfortable outside with heavy equipment and foul mouthed humans in ditches and just everything dirty. I loved it. It was, it was amazing. Um, but over the years, you know, I kept blowing my body up because I would be doing that work in the summer and it was hard manual labor. And then I was, um, working in the winter time and skiing at a professional level. And I was a professional athlete at that point and competing and getting paid to compete. However, the competitions were extreme skiing and skier cross where, you know, it, it, you don't have insurance back then. And, and like, you weren't making very much money. I would maybe make 500 bucks if I won something, but most of the time I crashed. So I had um, probably had six or seven surgeries by the time I was 24. And I went limping back to my boss after a season of skiing. And I had a hand in a cast. I, I'll never forget this. My right knee was completely blown. I was in a, a brace and my hand was casted. And I'm like, I need my, my summer job. You know, I'm back to work labor. And he's like, you need to go back to college. What are you going to do? Can I come back? What are you going to do? And I begged and he brought me back in for that summer, but I had to think really hard because I think he was, you know, calling me out on my, on my activities here. And I ended up, um, he told me about landscape architecture because I said, well, I want to be an engineer. I'm on this construction site. There's a woman who's a civil engineer and I want to be just like her. She's, she's so smart and she's so pretty and she's strong and she's the boss. But I didn't have the math brain at all. And I, I didn't know what my brain was. And he told me, um, you know, landscape architecture, you might want to look into that because they're the people that design ski resorts. And the minute he told me that, I was done. I went to school, I got straight A's for five years solid. I buckled, buckled my butt down and I, I went to a different school. I was um, in Crested Butte for many years and then I went to Colorado State um, University in Fort Collins and I finished school. And then the very first thing that happened was I got a job with a company called Snow Engineering, SE Group, and they are a ski resort design company. They actually just did the master plan for Schweitzer. Um, and they were based in all places, Vermont. So here I am, I, you know, I'm on like boyfriend number 20 and wanting to stay in Colorado the rest of my life. At this point, I was 30 and I was looking for my forever home and forever husband and, you know, all that good stuff. Hey, I'm going to settle down. And um, sure enough, I ended up in Vermont. They sent me there to go work. So I lasted a whopping three months because they just they didn't get enough snow. But the great thing about it was I got the foundation of and a taste of what that type of design was and, and how to sit in the back shop and do my AutoCAD and learn another tool of the, of the trade of landscape architecture. I also got to go see things that I learned in school. And this is one of the projects. So this is Storm King. 
This is in upstate New York. And this is a project that was um, built by the famous land artist, Andy Goldsworthy. Have any of you heard of Andy Goldsworthy? Yeah, so, so being that my mom's also an artist, um, she, she's always influenced me and I've gone to every museum in the world that I possibly could with my mom. And you know, she was trying to constantly get me to go back into school. And so it was really exciting when she would take me on trips to go see places like this. So this is Storm King in, in New York and this is one of Andy's projects and he's known for land art. And this is a permanent one where he actually did this, um, this wall that is one of his classic curving walls. Well, anyway, in my journeys of jobs, after quitting and deciding that I wanted to go ski more powder and work less in the office and get back outside, um, I ended up in Aspen. And um, I had, I worked for a big firm for a couple of years in Vail called Hart Howerton. And we were um, arguably still is one of the most, uh, pro, they're one of the best uh, landscape architecture, urban planning, interior design firms in the world. They, they do all the top resorts, um, any major resort that you, been to that you remember they probably did um, because they're so good at creating memorable places and so I spent two years with them and then I got laid off in 2008 three times and I ended up in my third job because of the recession um, I, I wasn't getting fired it was just the recession was happening in 2008 I ended up in Aspen and I ended up working on a project with Andy Goldsworthy so life turns full circle um, this was the project um, it's the Aspen Institute. The Aspen Institute is a think tank. It's where people go to, great leaders go to figure out global problems. Um, it's a campus. It has um, Bauhaus architecture everywhere. It's very sterile and flat with all these great landscape architecture um, landforms with runnels of water that move through the site, all this cool stuff. It's a really neat place if you're ever there. And uh, Bauhaus architecture is just so sterile and it's just stark. And my job, I was hired to turn this stark, sterile landscape of turf into native grasses and sustainability. And they were trying to wean off the Institute off of um, herbicides and all the nasty toxins. And they were gonna live off their own land and yada, yada, you know, peace, love, and let's make that happen. And Aspen, you can do that. So they had all the, all the money in the world, but it was still the recession era. So um, anyway, Andy got brought out to do this, this serpentine wall and the serpentine wall flows through the landscape and into the building. And then when you go into the building, it, it reveals itself down into the basement. Um, and this was foundational in my career because working with him, um, he, he's from, uh, I think he's from England or Scotland, I'm pretty sure England, but he lives in Scotland. Um, but him and his stone workers were there and I was trying to tell him I'm going to green the institute and he, he freaked out on me. He didn't know what that meant. It was a, a communication barrier. And I said, no, no, we're, we're going to get rid of all this turf and we're going to make it native plants and turn it into a, a healthy native um, vegetation site. And so once we were able to communicate, he understood. But then then I got laid off again. So I went back to Crested Butte to go be a ski guide and, um, and open up a, a backcountry ski resort called uh, Irwin. And I always had, a, I had two careers in the ski world. Um, and I was trying to start a firm at that point and get my licensure in landscape architecture. This was a long time ago. Yeah, this was 2009. Um, and just try to find my way. But it, it took a couple of years and I ended up in, in Boulder going into an engineering firm for a couple of years. Um, this is my portfolio of just, you, you know, I'm, I'm, all, I'm too busy really. I don't slow down to really take a true portfolio because God forbid I do something like that, but I can make Google Earth and drop some pins on a map. So this is how I've gotten jobs in the last few years, but um, luckily I've only had two. But <laughs> uh, I ended up in Boulder and worked on a bunch of projects there with government. And because it was the end of the recession, which I think, you know, if we do see an economic downturn, we're going to see similar trends of tracing money from from the engineering world, and the money will come in. And right now, I'm I'm tracking funding for trees, and um, you know, there's 1.5 billion coming in to us in the next couple of months. Um, all the states are going to be getting money for for tree work, and I'm also the city forester. So it's pretty cool when you start tracking money and and 
seeing, you know, okay, well, this is what's going to lead to my projects over the next couple of years. And where can I, where can I partner on this? And who else can I help with that pot of money? Um, so anyway, that's what I learned in Boulder. We did a lot of trail work, a lot of boutique bridges, um, some place making work, but the firm I worked for was Loris and Associates and they weren't a normal engineering firm. They were heavy in the arts. And that was where I learned that engineers of all people who are the most linear, they're the opposite of me and probably the opposite of most of us here. They, the engineers that I knew, they were self-pronounced, self-proclaimed creative engineers. And here I was their landscape architect that they had hired, the token one, the only one. I was also doing their business development. And I, and for two years, I worked with them hand in hand on, you know, how can we, how can we um, develop projects and go after and pursue projects and bring in the work in a different way than all the other competing firms in a time when everyone's starving. And um, that really started to make me think about placing. And it's not about a bridge. It's not about a sidewalk. It's about a sidewalk that the kids are connected to the senior home at the end of the street. And maybe there's an opportunity to teach those kids on that sidewalk about uh, bio swales and infrastructure, green infrastructure that could filter their water. And then maybe maybe the seniors at the other end of this would have a garden that they could actually pick fruit out of. That's how I started to think. And I learned that from the engineers and during the, the time in Boulder. So ever since then, I've been cross-pollinating fields and I don't really care what your title is anymore. I don't, it doesn't matter. It's what, what, are, what are your ideas and where do we all fit in? And so that sort of built my foundation of, of the, the, the past, I'd say, 12 to 15 years. Um, and then eventually, a couple of years after Boulder, I fell in love with one person who I, I'm now married to <laughs> and decided I'm going to settle down. Um, and it took four months to figure that out of skiing him into the ground and chasing him in the mountains. And then I had to find a home where we could live together, but it was still, it was 2012 and the economy was still pretty bad and the mountains hadn't recovered yet. So I couldn't go back to a ski town and we couldn't find a place to live. And um, I met some, some ladies from Alaska who offered up a cabin and said, why don't you come to Alaska? The economy is great here. There was no recession at the time up there. And um, four months after dating, we drove up the Alcan and we, we spent 10 years in Alaska. We got married there um, in Hope, Alaska. And um, my husband, Carl, and I, and um, he works at the ski resort now. So coming out of a helicopter, by the way, on a mountain. <laughs> yeah, we just <laughs> you know, my rule of life is to mine it, it's yours. <laughs> That's how I live always. I, I just made when I first met Mage, we were talking about weddings. I think it, somehow we got on that. We get on many creative <laughs> tangents, but she like gets out a magazine and was like, here's me and my wedding. <laughs> oh. You're such an onion. I called the bird cage to my boss. She put me in a fucking bird cage and it's been a big bucket. <laughs> and, and now they're framing in my one window and I'm an architect. Like, if you want to starve me, shut my window off. <laughs> Stick me in a bird cage that's the size of a phone. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. To try and survive in these environments, you have to be really creative and you have to be strong. -willed. Luckily, the gym is right next door. So if I actually go there when I'm not sick, um, I tend to burn off some steam. Um, but I'm a feisty one, you know, they really shouldn't put me in a box. The bird is going to turn into a uh, dragon. Um, I've been, I've been at home. This is my mentor on government. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I know we're being recorded and I've already said fuck once, I'll probably say it. I'm not really, I'm not really sorry. It's, it's an accident. Right. When I get fired, I might come come to her. For the city municipality of Anchorage, um, I was their senior park planner, landscape architect. Um, we had a powerhouse of a team. Anybody is anyone familiar with Anchorage? You can unfollow Alaska politics at all. Oh, it's fun, let me tell you. I, when I got there, there was a, a pretty conservative mayor in, and it's, it was his last year, Senator or Mayor Sullivan, not Senator Sullivan, there's two different things, same name, two different people. Um, pretty conservative, but we were on the tail end of getting all this money from the state 
and the state had been giving money and the community didn't have to weigh in on their projects. They just would go fix things or build new parks. So when I got there, I spent about the first three years being handed hundreds of thousands of dollars up to millions of dollars in projects. And it was whatever you could get done, get it done. We've got the money for you. So we were madly um, updating our city parks and our trails. And um, it felt like I was made for that position, you know, with my hyper attitude and, and my personality and getting to be outside. And they're, they're pretty similar to here. They're, they're casual, outdoorsy people up there and they live off the land and it's really humble. Um, I, I just loved it. And then the money just started to dry and it was because of the oil. So, and then we got a different mayor, um, very liberal and he opened up the city to, he literally opened up city hall to um, the bus station. So all the homeless were in the bus in the city hall. And you like little by little, you started to experience like a different type of leadership and what it would be like. And um, the city started to change mostly because the money was drying up. And um, what happened was in order to do a project, we, would, we, 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 need, we now had to get bond money and um, to ask the community to vote for these bonds. And we didn't ask for a lot. It would be like on average 1.3, 1.6, maybe two at most million. And we had, oh, we had 283 parks, so um, over 10,000 acres. So it was, you know, it was um, kind of a, a feeding frenzy amongst the, the staff of, you know, you're always lobbying for your projects, but they stuck me on a lot of the big capital improvement projects. In fact, that was my schlick for many years. And luckily they were multi-year projects. And so they were phased. So I almost always had, had my projects budgeted. Um, but during that time, you had to really get embedded with the community and um, learn how the, how the community, how to, how to motivate them and incentivize them, but also get them to show up to meetings and tell you what, what they want. So I became obsessed with civic engagement and uh, working, working with people. And I went through a humanities forum leadership program um, and Anchorage is amazing. Did you know it's the most diverse city in the world or in the United States? more diverse than Chicago or New York City. They speak over a hundred languages in the school district. Um, it's remarkable. It's, it's a welcoming city. So they have um, refugees and immigrants from all over the world. And then it's also um, the uh, Alaska Native community. There's, I don't even, I can't even count how many different tribes there are, but there are so many different tribes and uh, people come from all different villages to live there. So um, it was really, really, uh, it fed my soul from the diversity side of life and the humanitarian side, because when you wanted to fix up a park or a project, you know, you go and I call it going native or, or going local. My brother was in the military, so I call it going native. That's where that comes from. Um, but like you embed yourself in that neighborhood and get to know everybody first before you even start a project. And I've kind of been doing that here. So the reason I'm telling you all that is, you know, this last year and a half, I've I've been getting embedded in the community and uh, making friends and learning how people tick and every neighborhood's a little different. Um, we have, you know, just a few parks in this town and um, not as much as, as Anchorage, but we have something special here that I, I chose to come here. Um, my, we, we got a new mayor in Anchorage, uh, what, about a year and a half, two years ago and COVID happened and I lost both my in-laws and. Um, I knew the money was going to dry up for projects and the writing was on the wall between the money drying up for projects and losing my, my uh, in-laws to COVID. I, my husband and I were out. We, we needed to get closer to family. So we wanted to come south and my mom lives in Denver and he has, we have family all over. So, but Denver, we're close enough to Colorado. <laughs> Mostly we're close enough to Canada here in Sandpoint. Um, so I, I, I looked for places that kind of fit our personality and our lifestyle and had the same things that we, we valued. Um, but what I really liked about Sandpoint was the opportunity to help protect and help be a steward of the land and, and protect the values of the people. And while I'm not of you all of Sandpoint, I wasn't born and raised here and I'm fresh and new. I feel like the landscape speaks to me because of what I come from. And 
truly the, the, the plants and the animals and the, the natural side of it is in me. And then I am a hardcore recreation player. I love to play. Like my, my middle name should be play. Um, unfortunately, I'm a trap bird. But, um, you know, someday I'm going to be rich and I can go just play. But um, the, the, the thing about here is we have this community that has worked so hard for what they have. And I want to help protect that. And so <clears throat> I feel like I'm a steward of the land, number one, first and foremost. Um, I greatly value conservation while I did work for ski resorts and all of that. But over a decade working in the public sector, you really learn how to protect the resources that you have because once you once you develop them, <coughs> once you destroy them, that's it. You're not going to get the get it back to what it was before. Um, so anyway, I, I want to just say all that and then dive into some projects. Um, Why don't you start with the train? Okay. So what was fascinating, um, like I said, Maeve's an onion, and I can't believe she's not like 80 because of all the different lives she's lived already but you look like you're 20. <laughs> um, but when one day I was in her office and she started clicking on some of these projects that she's worked on in Anchorage and I it, oh my gosh like it blew me away like yes I know she's talented yes she has this extensive background but I wanted you all to see some of her body of work because it, it truly is incredible. And it got me really excited. And, and a lot of the diversity of her projects really kind of ping to different individuals you know, that are in our group that have projects that have synergy with what she's done. So I thought it would be really special for her just to share a, a few of the many that she's worked on. And Hannah, I think of the caboose particularly this is, they had a boost as well in Anchorage. Yeah, and it's really fun. Um, there's a little music. We had to, just like your engine, but it's not where I got the music, it'll echo. Just like with your um, locomotive in uh, Lakeview Park, we had one that we had to um, abate and yours will have to be abated as well. I, I imagine, I'm pretty confident. Um, the things that we have to abate on, and it, it's it's lead, it's um, lead paint, and it's grease and oil. Um, there might be some asbestos in how they put the engines together, but I've become an engine expert. And with every project, I absorb them. They live in me. They become little children. I don't have children, sadly, but I have I have developed over fifty projects um, in the last ten years. So I've had many little children. Um, Anyway, this is about the abatement process. So we had to literally tent it and go hazmat on this thing and clean it all up to make it safe for the public. And um, the train itself, my boss, she was so great, but she didn't give me enough money for that project. But um, talk um, about the timbers. You're probably yeah. getting to that. Um, I loved that aspect of it. What, what was fun about this project was strategically trying to find money, which is always my, my game in life. Um, they gave me 150,000 to do the abatement and it really cost 300,000, but I got to meet some local builders there and convince them that um, this was good press, good media, because this was our down, one of our downtown parks called the Lane Park Strip. And it's a big old airstrip that they turned into a, a park. And this is just a pocket of that big giant park. And um, we made a little pocket park and then my friend Chad, who's a landscape architect too, and we went to the railroad. We literally went to the railroad and we begged to go look at their scrapyard. And what do you know, in their scrapyard, they had old rail ties and the Alaska Railroad is just like every other railroad. They're kind of the mafia of America, right? So <clears throat> they, they can be really intimidating, but they opened up their, their junkyard to us and let us reuse old rails and we created signs with the wheels and the old rails, the benches. The wood is actually old wood that was reclaimed from old park signs. Um, my maintenance guys were ripping out the old signs and we just refurbished them and turned them into the wood for the seats. Um, and then the, the 
the signs in that are in there and the um, graphics and the story, there was a woman who wrote a kid's book about Alaska Railroad 556, old 556, because there's only something like 60 of these engines and they were the powerhouses in World War II and they, they could go up and over the mountains. I, I don't know the history of yours, but we'll have to, have to talk about it, Hannah. And, and, and we can. Hannah, theirs is not open to the public, like to be able to physically go in because of a liability as with some of the things we face with, you know, when you have it open and kids are climbing on it, you know, so this, yeah. Bring it up. Once you decide you're gonna clean up your engine, not necessarily yours, but just one in general, you have to bring it up to the level that would be safe for children, which essentially falls under these um, codes, the ASTM codes, um, American Safety Codes. And that's where that's where my landscape architecture brain turns on. I sound like an engineer, and I'll spare you that. But you start to have to follow and adhere to this really technical stuff. And you, now you're in it. Now you're into a million dollars, and I had one hundred fifty thousand. So how on earth was I going to get this project done for one hundred fifty? And um, that's this is what we did. We, we could only afford a small little trail that goes around it and the planting. But um, uh, Chad used the, the rail timbers to create the barriers, um, not the timbers, sorry, the, the rails themselves, the steel rails to create the, the beds that go around. Um, and then just really simple. So my cost really, all I really had to pay for in this landscape was Chad and um, his company. Um, and the concrete, the, all the materials were free. And he, Chad is a landscape architect slash artisan. So he does welding and his wife is the plant, she does all the plants. Um, and so a lot of the project was in kind, yes, the community. And I love like the idea of a pocket park because you don't have to have a lot of space to have that place making happen. And the sustainability, I mean, such a creative project. And it, it only took us, um, it took us about two and a half years. No one believed me that this was a treasure. And then, you know, I, I think I just had this idea and I could see the vision and I, I was getting to know the, who would be good at what. Um, and so that's where that was a good one. Um, let's go back. Um, what are some of the things that you see the commission uh, being able to help with here now in Zamboy? Yeah, that's a great, a great question, Ellie. Um, well, we have some big projects. Traverse, return to Traverse Park. Uh, it's at 7.5 million right now, plus another 300,000 for the state park expansion. I just applied for a land water conservation grant that will hopefully get us a million dollar playground, but it's not just a playground like everything else. Um, it is going to be uh, an inclusive play space basically for, um, sorry, I'm trying to get, get to it so I can take you there virtually. Um, the playground's gonna be a plaza and tell all the stories about Sandpoint. Um, it's, this is one of those projects that everyone should be able to see themselves in. So I really see working with you all in a way that is very dynamic. Um, we're just in the infinite stages and because I've just been kind of thrown into uh, these kind of projects, we have this neat, I don't know if this picture, I can't, oh, there we go. There we go. So so this is the, this was just the concept to get the project going um, when we got the donation. But, um, and, and this is just a rendering, my, my architect had given me a, a, a model frame and then I just rendered it with watercolor over. and. And this project simulated a donor to donate two bronze sculptures. And you can see there's a bear and there's a cougar and a cub. Um, and they would have donated any kind of animal, but we globbed onto the Patrick McManus theme and the Patrick McManus story of Standpoint. And then the donor for this project, Mr. James E. Russell, he grew up with Patrick McManus and there's a character named Rex and that is James Russell. So where I see you all coming in is um, this project is now turning into this monster project and hopefully this will come up. Oh, I'm sorry, it's got poor memory. And the bronzes were started before the commission was 
put together, but we certainly, according to the policy and procedures of public art, will be working with NAVE on placement. And it, this might be a two-phase project, but because it's public art, that's where we come in, um, working with, with those beautiful bronzes. And then that placemaking too, where are those themes with, um, with McManus, who is a local artist. He was a local author. He lived here, he's nationally celebrated. Um, and where, where do those themes tie into to that cross-pollination of recreation and play? Right, exactly. And I'm gonna start talking about this one for um, next week at city council. And then as we move on over the next couple months, I'm, I'm gonna start engaging with all of you because we originally were doing this as design build and um, we've just changed the contractor. So um, it's been a little bit of a, a project to kind of navigate, I'll say. Um, it's not easy. This is definitely the hardest project of my career. Um, but the project, oh, sorry. Did I not bounce around? Maybe I'll say. The project is um, a really good example of where I see us coming together. Um, so we're going to, the existing tennis courts are right here at Traverse Skate Park is down here on the south. And then the new, there's going to be a new building that's going to be a tennis pickleball building. And it's going to have four tennis courts that are overlaid with uh, pickleball, 16 pickleball. And then there's this whole multi-use entrance, the south side, and a big gateway plaza. So I can't show you what all of that looks like yet because we are still in, I don't want to show anybody anything until it's for sure happening. Um, so we're, we're finishing up the design on that before it's public, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks we will be public. But what I can show you is this playground. So this playground is not just a playground and it flows through the whole site and it's all about, you can kind of see a little river there. Um, it's all about the standpoint stories and stuff. Of Which that cultural collective campaign comes into play because we'll be doing the cultural collective campaign hopefully with the Russell family finding out more about the seat of that. So again, when the public engages this area, we'll get to see themselves and those connections yeah, at a whole level. A lot of um, bandwidth right now to show you the whole playground, but it's really a plaza, it's a splash pad, and it's all universal, universally designed, um, which means it's for people of all abilities. And I, I need I need your committee to help me with the stories and the art and the theme. Every park from here on out, and I want to go back to um, back to some of my work to show you. Every park is going to start to take a different theme, really. Not necessarily like an animal or whatnot, but you're going to start to see culture reflected in in your public spaces, and whether it's through the benches or it's through um, the trails through the signage. Um, there's just so many different ways to do that. And I don't have all the answers, but what I can do is show you what I've worked on um, before. And I just want to show you at least one project that I think will really make you guys. And Mabel, you're pulling that up. Um, it's amazing the cross energy that Maeve is able to pull in with like the water ecology and the watershed and how that's gonna actually come through the, the play structure at Traverse. And, and not only visually will it tie into um, th that, that look and the play for the children, but it has to do with the water ecology as well. I mean, so there's so many big, picture, so usage, I ecology, I play. Um, is we don't have enough time. Of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, you're cutting close, but if if you want to, I'll come back and we can do a deeper dive. I Where I see that interplace is um, I'm going to really lean on you all for advice and ideas and we're gonna we're gonna do workshopping we're gonna you know you're gonna get assignments um i'm just starting to get this figured out of how to do all this um i'd love to um have our commission be alerted when there are workshops you know it's hard sometimes mm -hmm. we don't necessarily hear things the, from the public roundabout way if we could actually be alerted Ahead of time, ahead of yeah. time, we would love to come support. And yeah, and I haven't done a lot of that yet. 
So you haven't heard a lot because there hasn't been a lot going on. Um, it's been that that project is is yeah I'm done talking about it because it's changing how we're going to do it, which is super exciting. Um, I do want to tell you about the the Little Sand Creek watershed. Right. So the road up to Schweitzer and then this whole area here. This is this is the watershed, and this is a view looking down below. The city, it's an 8,000 acre watershed and all the water that drains off the ridges goes down and feeds the Little Sand Creek. The Little Sand Creek feeds into the Sand Creek. That is the Little Sand Creek watershed is our, our number one water source. It has the cleanest water. We have a, a treatment facility at the bottom of Schweitzer Road. Um, my, my task is to develop a watershed recreation plan up here. And we're working with the National Park Service uh, rivers, trails, and conservation on that. The city owns 5,000, about 5,000 of the 8,000 acres. Then it's owned by BLM, the state, and the Forest Service, and then Schweitzer. Um, and we've been working with different steering committees. We've had focus groups. We hired the International Mountain Bike Association to help us specifically with the trails. Um, so this project is one that I thought was just going to be a simple slam dunk. But as I started to dive in into it, I realized the connections to the Kalispell tribe, the connections to the history of Schweitzer, the history of people, how people have used this land, the Forest Service, um, the history of the Forest Service and, and forestry management throughout North America, particularly Idaho, is a very detailed, rich history and one worth honoring. And there's just all these cultural stories and these overlapping layers. Um, so we're just starting to scrape through all of that. But the big gist of this is that rec while it might be a recreation plan, recreation, conservation, arts, culture, placemaking, historical preservation, all of that overlap. So it's my job to take all the information, overlay the layers and filter out. And then from that, from whatever that pattern is that comes out, that will be the plan. Um, so you're gonna get tapped on that as well. And we're just, it's, it's, we're what clay you're on this committee it's like nine months now we've been working on this maybe and we we are just scraping the surface like the number one thing was to deal with the trails because they were we've already existing trails there and we had to manage that um but we're just getting into the, the good stuff the cultural side and, the, and all of that so there's going to be a lot of opportunities with this and i don't know what that looks like yet ellie but um and i think all of you who have different interests i'm going to hopefully learn who likes to do what but there's going to be a lot of opportunities for this. We're going to be developing trailheads, trails, the, the, the cultural connection to the tourism. We're going to work with the chamber. And all of this, since it feeds into the Sand Creek and into the lake, it all connects to the downtown waterfront, which is crazy because then the backside of this watershed also connects to Travers because when you're at Travers, you're looking at the backside of it. You're looking at Baldy. So these places, these stories are parks are going to start to tell the story from the land, from the culture, from our history. So um, it, this is amazing. And I mean, you do so much. So it's like, where do you even start, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I love the idea of doing, I'll send them a follow-up where they can click on the different parks that you've done too, yeah, because like there's this musical part. Karen, that I was like, oh, you would love that, you know, music engagement and yeah. park and all of these things. So the, uh, yeah. due to time, um, I'll send a follow up of some of the other projects, but I think it's, it's really good for you guys to say and, and to hear from, from leadership when you, what are, what is our role? Like, where are we going to be involved? And so I just kind of wanted to give you a deep dive, a little tickler about like, there's, we're just starting to scratch the surface in terms of, of the power and impact that we as a commission um, are about and how we can support um, all the different projects going on at, with the city. So Dave, is there anything else? Oh, no, this is the, I'm just going to play it. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry if you have the link because I don't even have Yeah, I'll link it up. Um, this is a music park and a, it's got swings. It's got all the normal stuff. It was in a really bad neighborhood. And then the kids, they like to destroy everything. So it had to be steel and then bright colors. It was in a, a tight area. So I, I just wanted to share this particular one. I want you guys to have this link and watch some of these videos. Um, this is about Justin, he's using the music equipment. And then I'm also gonna share a link about indigenous placemaking. 
Um, this was a big project that I worked on for about five years working with the Alaska Native community. Um, Anchorage, as you probably imagine, is quite, um, well, it's historical, the Nine land, which is the indigenous tribes from there, but um, it's very important to me to bring indigenous cultures to our forefront and um, honor and respect them and also include them at the very beginning of a project and not at the end. And so those are my, my big things that I want to share with you all. Thank you so um, much. One other thing I have to leave, leave you with is the bells and the whistles. I'm obsessed with inclusive play. And I think inclusive is all ages and playgrounds are not just for kids. I don't have kids. I go to go to playgrounds all the time. Imagine if you have a meeting at a playground, you can really make some progress in life. <laughs> I'm serious. You know, sit on a swing with your enemy, and I promise you, you will not be enemies by the end. Negotiate a business deal. But um, there's so many different disorder disabilities besides mobility. Mobility is just one, but every one of us is disabled at some point, whether you stub your toe or you're in a wheelchair or you know, you, you have a headache, whatever. There's just different forms of disability. Um, but uh, one in four children right now has autism. So statistics for autism are super high and autism is invisible. Um, so sensory and tactile, and that's a lot of, you can do a lot with art and um, sensory work. So I just think functional a lot of the times the architect in me wants to make everything functional and that's where I need the artist of Cami to pull that out and make it less functional but you know finding that balance and, and having fun so so as you can anyway. see we are in amazing hands with Maeve being our um, park planner and development manager and um, we're looking forward to working with you on these amazing projects and I really appreciate you taking the time to share today. Absolutely. And for all of you to, to have a face to a name. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if there's no other questions for me, we'll move on to 6C, Stephen Lyman Community Art Show. Okay. So let me share my screen. Um, I was contacted by the curator of the Stephen Lyman collection. He is a nationally recognized artist from here. Um, on the bottom left hand side, you can see his body of work. Um, very, very popular. Ellie, probably like in the 90s. Every, yeah, very much. Um, so he, he has the first 60 pieces of his public art. Um, that is on exhibition and he, his wife, Stephen Lyman is no longer with us. Um, and his wife wanted to honor the community by having a free to the public art show here. And he was essentially looking for um, space that would be free to be able to have the show. So what I did was I acted as a connector and I called POAC and um, they immediately came up with the idea of holding the show at the University of Idaho's Ag Center. They have an amazing relationship going with the U of I, and they've been doing quite a few exhibits there. Um, and the U of I agreed to sponsor the event um, at that venue. So this is a collaboration between the city of Sandpoint, POAC, and the University of Idaho. Um, and so beyond being that connector, we're gonna be promoting the event through all of the city media avenues. Um, it will, because of the, the timeline, it's going to be June 1st through the 3rd and we're still determining the date, but it will be able to be in the spring, summer parks and rec booklet, which is great because when we think about recreation, let's think about art and too, you know? And so, this is just a wonderful objective in our arts, culture, and historic master plan. So as things move forward, I'll be keeping you guys all apprised of it. And you all are ambassadors of this event. So okay. any questions? It's a beautiful space. It's uh, For those who haven't been out there, it's uh, on North Boyer, past the Swiper Terminal, just a little ways past there. And um, yeah, I hadn't been there until- Yeah, and then you're like, whoa. <laughs> Uh, yeah, in the fall, we had, there was a presentation for John got a scholarship, and so we were out there, and I was like, what is this? So, and yeah, it's yeah. a beautiful building, and it'll be a beautiful space for the 
for the show? It was oh. a, a, owned by Dennis Pence mm -hmm. and Chris Contour, our local nationally renowned architect developed it. It is just gorgeous and it is this hidden little jewel. So uh, well, I think it's I gonna be perfect. Talk about this, like, because I didn't realize your group, but we, the watershed group for the recreation watershed, which ends right here, the creek actually connects the little sand creek comes down off Schweitzer and flows right through the site here, the actual property. We are having a um, STEM um, uh, science student education week, and there's going to be a lot of other things going related to the watershed and the prob project that we're doing there at that same week. I think it starts like the very next day on the second floor. So it's great to have land art, particularly art that's about the landscape in the building at the time. Um, yeah, it's a can it is a campus if you haven't been there. So <clears throat> yeah, there's a, an, or an orchard and trails. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any other questions on that? You'll just keep us updated. Absolutely. For, uh, what, will, what will be happening? Definitely. Right. All right. Well, that, that, that leads us to 7A, which is around the room. Uh, does anybody have anything? Yeah, I'd like to thank you, Mayor, for coming mm -hmm. and also for coming to Sandpoint, bring your expertise, experience, and you knowledge. Uh, and it's Valentine's. Yeah, happy Valentine's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to announce and encourage all of you our uh, OPO Reps education program at their our Witcher One Acts are up this Saturday at the Canada Theater. We've got two performances at four o'clock and seven o'clock. Doors open half an hour before. It's a ten dollars suggested donation, and all the donations go to support our education programs to make them accessible to our kiddos. So go see some kiddos. They've been working so hard. They're actually a lot of them have been directing and creating these scenes themselves. So they've turned into little production crews and Courtney's okay. just done such a beautiful job with it. So I'm just over the moon proud. Great, thanks, Katie. Do you wanna okay, perfect. Um, and again feel free to share any upcoming events or things that you guys know of with arts, culture, and historic preservation. Quite a hello. Oh hi no it's just uh, uh Thank you for all your work. And, um, I work on engineering stories. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the carousel project, things are starting to, to roll along. We, uh, um, you know, I don't know if the design competition is going to do what that's going to do, but obviously we're, we're hopeful that we're going to yeah. see some, uh, some extraordinary stuff. We have some designs and some thoughts for the location or whatever. And so we're starting to get to the point where we really want to connect what you all are doing to what we're doing. Ultimately, this is not just a carousel, it's about an art center with exhibition space and, and, and it's really focusing on arts, supporting the arts and culture aspect of the town using the carousel as a springboard to, to create that kind of stuff. So um, we'd love to come in and give you a full presentation on, on the whole thing at some point and uh, with the idea of, of creating that synergy as we create our programs or whatever. You know, we're going to want to be uh, relying heavily on Connections with, with, with the public private partnership, but this, is the, this really is the organization mission to kind of help us direct, direct some stuff. So, um, you know, whenever uh, a point, PowerPoint like this is a good dialogue, uh, love to get on your agenda on one of these meetings. Perfect. Uh, show you what we're doing and get ideas back. So now I can start, start um, going further afield than our, our fairly sizable group, but, uh, you know, that's fantastic thank you clay appreciate clay, it for the record what's your last name Hutchison. how do you spell it h-u-t-c-h-i-s-o-n thank you and we'll certainly you were one of the recipients of the nea art funding yes. sub grants and um, so i know in march we'll start getting those semi-annual reports so we'll definitely be Staying tied to you and right, yeah, energetic way. Not, not yeah. At one point, Judith Gerson, Very good. Thank you.
Any, Mike, did you have anything to add? Sorry, it's a little, yeah, <laughs> sorry, Mike, it's a little choppy there with our reception. All right, well, if there's, uh, oh, Woody? I wanted to see if we could get what, what the status was on the design, uh, waterfront design contest, because I came down to the city council meeting in the middle of January, and they said they were going to approve it the next week at a special meeting, and that meeting. That was a mistake of the beat. Yeah, well, I don't, yeah. you, know, I don't mean, yeah. you know, but the, the bottom line is, is they said that there was going to be a process that was going to get this thing done by June in that meeting. Yeah, and now we're, now we're at 30 days past that day. I can speak to that, Woody, and actually I'm going to be giving you an update at the next meeting, but why, why it's not on the agenda is because it's going to cancel with the updates tomorrow. At, so it will so. be presented? It will be presented, tomorrow. and hopefully that will be... Um, oh, okay. Yeah. I just, you know, it's just like all of a sudden it just kind of went quiet. And I was just kind of trying it, to. When, it yeah, we, there was just changes that needed to be done from council. So then it went back to the designers. Yeah. The changes are made and then it goes back to council, which is tomorrow. And it's just a process when you have multiple parties involved. Right. Well, my biggest concern is that it's the same as it was from the beginning is that we have significant development pressure downtown and they st originally stated this would be done in june i can, because of all these multiple party pressures and stuff sure. i just don't see that happening in that time frame and i think it's really important for us to be considerate as an organization whether we can make a recommendation to the council or whatever about this interim period here because it's a pretty wide open gate right now. A lot of people could drive a lot of development through. You know, every, everybody's well aware you know, of, of what needs to be done for the 20 years of master plan that indicates design standards and historic preservation. And that's part of the design competition is taking all of those different plans and creating that one master plan which also is supportive to the comprehensive plan. And then once the comprehensive plan is done, that's when any changes that need to be made that have been identified to code change will be done. So it is a true process and we can certainly share with council, but one thing you're gonna love in March is I'm going to do a deep dive into historic preservation and um, how that process is going to work, how we are going to be involved, all of those things. And I think that will make you feel a little bit better. So you can speak to people that are coming up to you probably at cocktail parties and different things and saying, what's going on, you know, and, and things are changing so fast because it is a fearful thing, you know, to the community when they see, when you walk around a block and there's a scrape historic building. So um, I, I'm doing every, I want to give you guys those sound bites and empower you with information. Um, but what, I, what I'm what i gonna do is do a whole follow-up and um, Maeve just put up the, the design manual, which I sent to you guys. But what I'm gonna do is send you guys the newest copy, which I got about a day ago, that has all the changes that um, council wanted in that document. So, so you guys... We're still on track. Yeah. So I know it can be frustrating at times, but with public processes, it's, it's no, tends to be how it goes. Process. I'm just kind of trying to figure out what, there's a, a big gap between now and when this thing's going to potentially all yeah. fit together with the it, different plans. And can, stuff. Considering like with government, I feel like it's moving pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to email me any questions and that goes for all of you. So if you guys have someone asks you a question, I don't know how to say I'm having a hard process, time processing this. Why is this taking so long? Like feel free to, to you know, email me and I can get that information to you because I know how it is to be asked questions or to have a hard time processing a timeline. And I'm here to support you guys and give you information. So can call me, send me an email. And I was there at both of those meetings and the changes that they made were 
a very specific timeline for public input, which is what council requested. So it is an important change. And the fact that, you know, it's, it's putting it off just about a month, it's, I think it's okay. So I'm gonna be at the meeting tomorrow okay. to support and, um, you know, hopefully things go our way. Yes. Yeah. I'm always like zooming in while I'm making dinner at home, know, but Ellie's okay. here supporting and representing our commission at all the meetings. And I really appreciate you guys doing that. But, um, and I can send you the links again. I can send an yeah, email send today. Um, and so that that's just, that will be good practice. Anytime something's coming up for council that has to do with the design competition or something that Maeve's working on that includes you, I'll ping you guys on that and okay. try to do that enough time ahead so you can plan it. Very good. All right, is there any, any other questions or comments? Yeah. Um, first, love to meet the leaders. Okay. I love the idea. Um, what also it, it would be great is uh, to throw an idea out there is the organizations. Yeah. If they could come in here, kind of introduce yeah. them. So we know them, yeah. but it, it, it'd be nice to be a little bit more formal. And here's my you know, 30 minute elevator pitch of our organization. Especially with all of these large planning efforts that are happening with like the Century Fund with the Panada, the Music Conservatories, Amazing Restoration, all of these things. I love that idea. So maybe a, a little, we'll, we'll pull that in and um, kind of that 15 to 30 minute thing, as long as I can keep everything else tight on the agenda. Okay, perfect. I love that. All right. Anything else? Thank you all. Thank Happy you. morning. I mean, that's <laughs> and it's only like 10 o'clock, right? <laughs> so are we officially we turning it?